A question for consideration based on the many stories of the gospel would be, of all the miracles that Jesus performed, which miracle do you think is the most important? As distinct from what miracle is your favorite, we all have our favorites, but what miracle is the most important miracle of Jesus? The resurrection, of course, notwithstanding. Perhaps one way of answering that question would be, how frequently do we see that miracle between the four Gospels? One answer might be the great catch of fish, because not only do we hear that miracle told in all four Gospels, but between the four Gospels, we actually hear of that miracle six times, because Matthew and Mark tell the multiplication of the loaves twice. But another possibility is also the Gospel we hear today, the great catch of fish. We only hear of that miracle in two Gospels, John and today's Gospel from Luke. They're both placed at different times in Jesus' ministry. Luke places it at the beginning and associates it with his call of the first disciples. John places the miracle at the end of his gospel and associates it with the resurrection. But in both cases, they conclude with a commission for St. Peter. In the gospel of John, Jesus asks him, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord feed my lambs. Three times they have that exchange. In the Gospel of Luke, Peter's response is what we hear today. Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, and Jesus gives his response. So even though we see it only in two out of the four Gospels, what happens along with that miracle, especially with regard to Peter and the resurrection, it is no doubt a very important miracle. And we can see it metaphorically, as symbolic of the great catch of fish, symbolizing the great catch of disciples of the church in its early decades. Even in the Acts of the Apostles, it says on that first Pentecost, 3,000 were added to their number just on that one day as a result of the preaching of Peter and the Apostles. So far does it get to symbolizing the number and emphasizing the large catch of fish that John goes so far as to tell us exactly how many fish there were caught in the net. And as a metaphor for the great catch of disciples and believers, it is truly a powerful one. But further reflection on that miracle and what it represents might give us a bit of pause and even deeper reflection as to our calling as followers of Christ. Because, yes, the great catch of fish symbolizes the great catch of disciples of the early church's history, but regardless of how many fish there actually were in the net, how many of those fish do you think actually wanted to be in the net? How many of those fish do you think were not desperately trying to get out of the net, desperately trying to escape? And that is symbolic of the work of the church in its mission throughout the world. And it reminds us of what Jesus says to Peter at the end of today's gospel. What does he say? He says, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be finessing men. No, he doesn't say that. He says, from now on, you'll be wooing men. No, he doesn't say that either. When Peter says, depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man, Jesus says, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. Catching. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, we don't have the story of the great catch of fish, but we have the story of the Great Commission that concludes the Gospel of Matthew. And what does he say to the disciples? He says, go out and suggest discipleship to all the nations. No. He says, go out and advertise discipleship to all the nations. No. What, in fact, he does say is, go out and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What Jesus gives is not a mandate. It's a commission. It's a command. It's not a suggestion but a mandate. 
and that our mission as his disciples is to go out in such a way that we bring people in and we work to develop a world based on Christian principles and Christian values. What's fashionable today that we hear, even among people of a Christian and even a Catholic faith, is oftentimes a rather reluctance to go out and make disciples of all the nations. We hear such things as, well, we don't want to impose our views on other people. Sometimes we even hear parents say, we don't want to impose our faith on our children. We'll let them decide for themselves. There's a reluctance and kind of a, a shy approach to the evangelization we're called as followers of Christ. How might Christ react to that in light of what he says in today's gospel and other places of the gospel. One might say, okay, Jesus would agree that, yes, he doesn't want us to impose our views on other people, but it certainly seems to hint that he wants us to ram it down their throats whether they want it or not. After all, we're there to catch men. We're there to make disciples. And how many of those fish that were caught do you think wanted to be in the net? How many do you think were not, by human nature, trying to resist the call of the gospel to live the standards that we're all called to live as human beings made in God's image and likeness? Now, of course, we know that Jesus is not demanding that we force people to embrace that faith. We do have something very cherished as part of our human nature, and that is free will. Jesus wants all the nations to become disciples, but not in a way that is a detriment to their free will. So how do we make disciples, even perhaps among those who don't want to be disciples? And there is where Jesus gives us that commission of all the nations to make disciples of them, to make and build a world based upon Christian principles and the standards of the gospel in which we love our neighbor in which we take care of those in need because we recognize Christ in them, which we give care to those who are sick because whenever we do it to the least of our little, the little ones, we do it for Christ. And we work for a people in which Christian justice and Christian standards are the norm. We certainly see it in other nations of other faiths. We see nations that are based solely, their society is based on Muslim faith, others that are based on Hindu faith. We know those countries. Are we to avoid building our own society and our own world based on the principles of our faith? And there are ways in which we have done that, even to the resistance of those who don't want it. Take just this country itself, built upon Judeo-Christian principles that many people seek to resist Many people seek to rebuild this country on secular, atheistic principles. But our nation has a grand history of being built on Judeo-Christian principles, the recognition of a God who gives us rights in which our government is there to protect those rights given to us by God. It's in our founding documents. And even where we did not do it perfectly from the outset, we've seen the principle of Christianity continuing to push our, nat our nation forward. What's an example? We have many people nowadays who love to remind us that our nation was founded with slavery. And, of course, we don't deny it. Neither do we deny that the, our church was founded with Judas Iscariot, who obviously was not among the best of the apostles. But what we often forget is, in this nation, slavery was abolished. And it was abolished thanks to a movement that we celebrate as the abolitionist movement which at its heart was a Christian movement. It was the churches that were pushing this abolition of slavery in our country because it's a Christian principle that all people of all races are made in God's image and likeness, have equal dignity before God, and are entitled equally to liberty with no exception. And our nation eventually rose to that occasion, and despite the resistance of those who did not want to see it happen, this Christian principle nonetheless became the norm in this country to the point now where even atheists today can't imagine slavery ever existed in this nation. About a hundred years later, the civil rights movement 
taking care of all the imperfections that was a result of abolition, was at its heart a Christian movement in this country. It had its heart and soul in the churches of this nation. It had people who staunchly resisted it, even on the highest levels of government. And yet, it is now a norm in this country. And we continue to push for equality of all people, of all races, of all faiths, to enjoy that liberty as people made in God's image and likeness. We are a nation now that can't imagine that kind of segregation or that kind of slavery ever existed because that Christian principle has been ingrained even among non-Christians of this country. Who knows? Maybe 100 years from now, the same thing will be said with regard to abortion. A pro-life movement that at its heart is a Christian movement in which the churches are the driving force behind a movement pushing us to cherish and protect in this country the most sacred thing that God gives us, which is life. Not everyone is Christian, but these Christian principles can become a part of our society that is built upon the Christian faith and Christian values. And while not everyone may convert to that, and there be may, may be many fish that are trying to swim out of the net, these are examples in which we can fulfill as a society and as a world that command that Jesus gives us to make disciples of all the nations because, as he tells St. Peter, from here on in you will be catching men. But how do we begin? We begin simply in the home. There's no point in transforming society into a Christian nation if we are unwilling to raise our children to raise your children as Catholic Christian men and women. How often do we hear people say, well, I took the family to Mass every Sunday. I gave them a Catholic education. They went to CCD or Catholic school. I taught them their prayers. I taught them what to do. But once they grew up and went to college, within a couple of weeks, they suddenly left the faith. Sometimes they'll ask the question, where did we go wrong? Depending on who I'm talking to, I don't often answer the question that directly, but really when you think about it, when parents raise their children in the faith, and that quickly, as soon as they leave home, they're leaving the faith, the question perhaps is not, what did they do wrong? The question might be, sincerely, what did they do right? But we do see examples of families raising their children in the faith who grew up to be productive members of the church who raise their children in the faith and pass on that faith from generation to generation. For some of us, the faith has been in our family for many, many generations and hundreds of years, going back further than we can count in our own genealogies. And we carry on that tradition by passing that faith on to our children, raising them in the values and principles of the faith in that first of all missionary activities of the church, parents introducing that faith to their children, catching the souls of their children, and forming them to be fishers of men and women, just as Peter and the apostles and the early Christians were. So let us hear that call in today's gospel, not just for Peter, but for us. Not just as a suggestion, but as a mandate, a commission, that in living our lives, in giving that example, in raising our families, and as responsible citizens and deep people of faith working for a society in which these Christian values are the norm, let us fulfill that commission that Jesus gives us, that he gave to Peter at the end of the Gospel of John, at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, when Peter beheld the great catch of fish. Let us behold the catch that the church has had down through these 2,000 years. Carry on the legacy, carry on the mission, carry out the mandate that Jesus has given us. Let us not be afraid. Let us go and make disciples of all the nations as we carry on the mission to catch men and women for Christ and the faith he has given us to profess.